Okay, so we're, we're still back uh, talking about the uh, conditional branching, and we're, we're going to sort of put it uh, to uh, rest, I hope, today, uh, from a sort of theoretical, from an explanatory point of view. Um, what we're about, you'll remember, is controlling the flow of program execution by uh, using conditional branches and by calculating the appropriate condition into the condition code register using uh, the instructions that the 68000 has. Um, and we, we covered these slides uh, the last day, uh, just a, a brief explanation of what the five condition code register bits are and what you might expect them to mean and the expected, the understood interpretation of them. Uh, the, the, some instructions that there are that ha are only there in order to uh, change the condition code register values. Okay, the compare instruction which uh, has always been the, uh, the, the source of a great deal of confusion, especially among people coming from another instruction set, from another, the, the Intel processor, the old 6800 processor. The way to remember the, the compare instruction is that it's exactly like a subtract instruction, <coughs> except for the fact that it throws away the result of the subtraction. It does not replace uh, the destination operand with the result. It just sets the condition code register as if the, uh, the subtraction had occurred. Okay, another instruction that we've come across is test against zero. And then to bring us up to date of where we were the last day, uh, as I recall, um, the bit test instruction. Now, the bit test instruction uh, allows you to specify uh, uh, which bit you're interested in testing the value of. So we haven't really looked at the use of bits individually uh, for anything in the 68,000. We've looked at uh, using bytes and words and long words for, say, numbers or characters and stuff like that. But you can use bits on their own for various uh, interesting purposes. One of them, for example, an obvious one, is uh, let's imagine you have a set of, say, 32 things, and you want to know whether that particular set has a particular member in it or not, or you want to say that that particular set, which could have up to 32 members, has a member, has this particular member or not. You could use the, the, a bit to indicate the presence or absence of a particular item in, in a set. So you can use bits to represent membership of set. You can use bits for all kinds of things, right? You can use bits as Boolean flags, true or false. You could use that just a bit. In fact, that would be a, a good use of them. And so in order to manipulate bits, you can use some of the shift instructions, the rotate instructions, but you can also use these bit instructions, bit test, which just simply tests the value of a bit that you specify, uh, bit set, which uh, tests the value of the bit and then sets it to one. You might want to write that down. It, it tests it first and then sets it. Uh, bit clear tests the bit first and then clears it, and bit change tests the value of the bit and then uh, changes it, inverts it from whatever it was to the opposite. Um, and these things set the Z bit in the condition code register according to the value of the bit uh, uh, as it was. Um, okay, just go back to the von Neumann architecture for a moment and you have the bus, you have memory where these bits will be, and you have the processor. Imagine you had two processors. Okay, this is getting common now. You could have a multi-core processor, a processor, uh, a chip with two processors in it, all connected to the same memory. Uh, there's a, 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 another instruction not listed here called test and set, I think it's called test and set, which looks very like bit set, uh, but it has a particular property which makes it useful in a multi-core or multi-processor environment. And we come to that in due course when we start talking about the bus. But anyway, in these, uh, in these uh, instructions, uh, when, the, when, the, when the test occurs, uh, if the bit that you specify is zero, the Z bit will be set in the condition code register. And if the bit that you uh, ask about that you specify is one, then the Z bit is clear. The Z bit in the condition code register is clear. So you get the inverse of the bit that you're looking for uh, in the Z bit of the condition code register. And then you can use a conditional branch uh, to uh, to make your decision on the basis of that. Okay, so how do you specify uh, the bit? Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to bother raising the, the slide there. What you have is uh, two operands. <coughs> okay, so you have bit test with say the first operand and the second operand. The second operand specifies uh, the field in which the bit is to be found. <coughs> now the field uh, could be anywhere in a in a 32-bit data register. Okay, anywhere at all in the 32-bit data register, or any byte out in memory. 
Okay, so the width of the field that you're looking for the bit in is uh, either 32 bits if it's in the processor on the data register, or it's, um, it's a byte in memory. Now remember, the 68000 is byte addressable. That means that the smallest unit of storage that the 68000 can physically access, okay, can phys there's a physical operation corresponding to this, the smallest unit of storage the 68000 can access is a byte. So no matter what you do, uh, if you're going to access, if you want to access a particular bit uh, in memory, you have to access the byte that it's in, and then you can specify the bit. Okay. So uh, if the bit in question is in a data register, you can specify it anywhere in the 32 bit, uh, uh, the 32 bits of the data register. But if it's in memory, you specify the bit as uh, one of the eight bits in a particular byte. So it follows then that if you think of the uh, instruction again, bit test first operand, second operand. If the second operand specifies the field, the first operand specifies the bit number, the bit number. Um, and the bit number obviously can be 0 through 7 if you're talking about a byte, and it can be 0 through 31 if you're specifying um, a bit in a data register. Okay. You look at the instruction set summary for the exact addressing modes, uh, but that's the overall idea of it. And it's very useful. So you could have, for example, suppose you wanted to represent a set which could be drawn from all the uh, alphabetic characters, all the letters, you'd say. Well, that would be a, a set of 26 possible items. So you could imagine constructing a bit field, you might call it a bit field, of 26 bits. So you'd, you'd have to size that up, I guess, for all practical purposes, to the next multiple of 8, which would be 32. So you'd have a 32-bit space, maybe in memory, 4 bytes in memory, and you'd be using 26 of the bits in it to represent the presence or absence of a letter in, in that particular set. Okay? And you can imagine writing code to add uh, an element to that set or to take an element away. So that's one way of, of uh, implementing small, small sets. Uh, sets with a small base type, I think it might be called. Okay, I was never very good at that. So there are the bit tests. So you have a whole lot of instructions, many of which actually is, uh, affect the condition code register as a side effect, so to speak. Some instructions whose only purpose is for uh, manipulating the values in the condition code register. And then finally, you have these bit-oriented uh, instructions for, for dealing with bits and uh, perhaps uh, affecting the condition code register as well. OK. So to summarize overall flow control, because that's what we're doing, uh, we have unconditional flow control. We can, we can just put in a, a, a loop that always occurs, or a branch that always occurs. Branch always, BRA, uh, or jump JMP. We, we've had a look at the various uh, uh, advantages of the one and the other. And then conditional flow control. We have to do the following. We have, if, we want to, if we want to make flow conditional upon something, we have to get that condition into the condition code register. So we have, to, we have to calculate the condition into the condition code register. So when you're doing this, you're saying, OK, I want to implement, we'll say, uh, uh, a repeat until or a while uh, loop, as I might think of it, in C. And I want a particular condition to, to, be, to control whether the while loop goes on. You have to take that condition and you have to turn it into something that you can put into the CCR. Okay, you've got to do that. That's part of the job, right? And it can be a non-trivial part of the job. Uh, so you have to calculate the uh, the condition, get it into the condition code register, and then select the appropriate the appropriate branch, the appropriate branch on condition. And here, for your reference again, are the conditions that the 68,000 will recognise as part of a conditional branch instruction. BT, for example, branch if true. Well, that's simply branch always, okay? Because true is a constant. The test is uh, is one true, and one is always true. True is always true. Uh, B F branch false means branch never, okay? Branch never. Hmm. So I've never used that myself. Um, branch of high, branch of low, or same. Branch of carry clear, branch of carry set, branch of not equal, branch of equal, branch of overflow clear, branch of overflow set, branch of plus, branch of minus. Uh, branch of greater or equal, branch of less than, branch of greater than, or branch of less or equal. Be very careful, as I said before, when you're dealing with uh, these um, pluses and minus and greater or equal and less than, because they include the V bit and the N bit. So you're talking about signed comparisons and signed calculations there. Make sure that if you're using them, that the, uh, the uh, parameters that you're, you're basing your conditional calculations on that those parameters are indeed signed. Okay. What does high mean? 
Hi, branch of hi, branch of hi, man. Um, <laughs> any other questions about that? <laughs> well, branch of hi means branch if the z bit isn't set, okay, branch if it's not zero, and that's the dot there is logical and branch if a, a carry has not occurred, okay, or a borrow. Of so, so just to take this, it's a very good example. When you want to figure out which of these uh, conditions that you need, have a, a look at these, because I find that these things, maybe it's just my uh, command of English, as you might agree, uh, I find that these are somewhat misleading. Okay, So I'm always going over to here to see what bits or what conditions they really test for, what they really need. Okay, so that's what I recommend to you, to, to look very carefully at what goes on here. And so then you'll be able to go back and say, okay, if I use a compare instruction, it might affect the C bit and the Z bit, so I should concentrate on those uh, conditions that incorporate the C and or the Z bit, so, something like that. You know? <coughs> so don't rely on simply, oh yeah, I'll use branch operator or that'll be fine. It mightn't be fine. If you're using uh, unsigned arithmetic to do your calculation, if you have unsigned representations of things, branch of greater or equal is definitely <coughs> not going to work right. Okay? It's not going to make sense. Okay. And remember again, just go back. The compare instruction subtracts the first operand from the second to set the condition code register. Okay, it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to be very uh, grammatically very nice, but that's the way it works. Okay, so uh, I was going to take an example. I think. <coughs> yeah. Now we I started to do this in a previous lecture. Uh, check to see if a character is a digit character. That is, is it in the range of the ASCII code zero to the ASCII code nine? Okay, so let's have a look at that now. I'll take up the, uh, I'll take up the uh, screen for this, all right. You've already seen how to how to check for the presence of a vowel, okay? So a vowel, if you take the lowercase and the uppercase, uh, there's ten vowels, and there's ten digit characters, zero to the, the character zero to the character nine. So you'd say, well, <coughs> sure, can't I use the same old idea? I'd have uh, maybe ten comparisons, and the answer is yes, of course you could. You could do that. However, we're going to take advantage of the fact that the the, the digit characters are uh, sequential in the ASCII code table. So that means that uh, the uh, ASCII code for zero is, uh, in hex, it's three zero. Okay, the ASCII code for zero. The ASCII code for one is three one. For two, it's three two in hex, and so on, all the way down to uh, eight and nine. The ASCII code for eight is hex three eight. I think you get the picture now. And the ASCII code for 9 is, uh, is 3. Okay, so they're in order. And so that suggests that what we might do, and this is why I chose this as an example, what we might do is um, we might see if we can make a comparison to exclude everything below the ASCII code of 3, 0. Okay? Uh, and if it's below the ASCII code for 3, 0, it's definitely not a digit character. And we might also then see if we can work out how to check to see if the, uh, the byte that we're looking at has a value that's greater than, strictly greater than the ASCII code for now. So rather than check all 10, we check their ends, we check their limits. Okay, so we'd have two comparisons rather than 10. We're taking advantage of the fact that it's it, they're all in a, in, in a sequence. Okay, so let's see if we can figure that out. Okay, so we have a, see if D0 contains an, AS, uh, an ASCII, uh, well, a digit character. Okay, and this is very common. Imagine you're, uh, well, just imagine this uh, as a possible place where you might use this kind of uh, code. Uh, you're, you're parsing incoming text from the keyboard, for example. You get a buffer full, you get a, you know, a whole lot of bytes of text that, say, the user has typed 
and you're trying to read through it, you're trying to parse through it, looking for the occurrence of a number. Like the user might type in, my telephone number is 087, blah, blah, right? So at that point, you might say, okay, I want to pick up uh, the first digit character. And what you'd be doing is be looking character by character through this until you hit a digit character. So that, that'd be an example. Okay, so if you want to see if D0 contains a digit character. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to compare it. I'm going to use a compare instruction. I'm going to use a compare and branch to, to check the lower end and another compare and branch to check the upper end. And if, it's, if it uh, is not a character, I want to branch to a particular place. And if it is a character, I just want it to fall through. Okay. So as far as a, a spreadsheet might, uh, sorry, spreadsheet, yuck, a flow chart might be concerned, what I'm trying to do is implement this. Is it a digit character? Question mark. The answer is no. I'm going to go off somewhere. If the answer is yes, I'm just going to continue, right? So that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to do. <coughs> I'm, going to use, I'm going to need two branches here. Okay. So first, the first one for the upper, for the lower end, is I'm going to compare it with uh, zero. Now I'm comparing it with the ASCII code for zero. I should say, B zero. And this is where you have to start. You know, as they say, put their cigarettes in and start. Okay. Um, because you have to imagine, suppose, uh, suppose, um, suppose D0 contains the value, uh, well, there's three possibilities, let's say, that we need to think about. One of them is that it's just under, okay, or lower. Uh, another is that it's actually on the, the, the money, 3, 0. And the other is that it's, it's above, right? So below, at, or above. <coughs> and that's in D zero, right? So one of those, one of those, let's say, values representing the value of D zero. Now, if you subtract zero, which is what you're doing here, if you subtract the ASCII code of zero from uh, these, what effect is it going to have on the condition code register? That's the question. Okay. So if you look at the compare instruction, actually, maybe I should look at the compare instruction. Does anyone have an instruction set summary there handy that I could just have a quick look at so that I can avoid misleading? Thank you very much. We look at the compare instruction. It's called arithmetic compare, and it does it has no effect on the x bit. Okay, so the x bit, do you remember I said the extend bit is like a <laughs> slow version of the carry bit, uh, in that it's not affected, uh, sorry, that the extend bit is only affected by arithmetic in instructions. Evidently, the compare instruction is not considered an arithmetic instruction in spite of its name. There you go. Uh, so the, the compare instruction sets the n bit, sets the z bit, sets the v bit, and sets the carry or borrow bit. Okay, have you, have you a question there, sir? No? No. Oh. Okay, so it sets, uh, sorry, it sets the x, the n, z, v, c. Okay, so if you subtract uh, the ASCII code for zero, which is three zero, suppose you subtract it from that, okay, the z bit will be true. If you subtract it from this guy here, the carry bit will be true because you've made a borrow. You've borrowed, right? And if you subtract three zero from say three one or something else, uh, carry will be zero and z will be zero. Okay. So you can actually work out just looking at carry and borrow. I have to tell you, I'm very. Uh, I was going to say conservative, but probably just stupid about uh, using these bits. Um, and I'm inclined to look to use the Z bit and the carry and borrow bit uh, almost always. And I really don't trust the M or the V bits. And I never really figured out the X bit. So anyway, that's just, uh, I suppose I shouldn't be admitting to my ignorance. But nevertheless, I, I'm much more comfortable using the Z and the C bits for this. So if we want, we could say, well, we could say branch if uh, what? Branch if. I would say, we could say branch if the carry bit is set. The carry bit is set to 1. It's not going to be set to 1 here because there was no borrow. And it's not going to be set to 1 here because, uh, because uh, the result is positive. Okay, no borrow needed. So I'm going to say branch if the carry set to uh, lucky loops, uh, nope. Not a character. Er, not, a digit, not a digit character, for sure. Because it means that if the carry bit is set after 
after performing this compare instruction, it means that the, the contents of D0 must be strictly below hex 30. Okay, but you can see how much effort you, you have to put in to making sure that you get this, that it's not off by one. Right? For example, we, we might inadvertently have a situation where uh, we, we were admitting 2f as a character, or where we were, we were not admitting 3,0 as, as a digit character. And both of those would be wrong. So you can be very careful uh, that you avoid that off by one situation. Okay, so a program execution flows through here. It means that it's definitely not a code whose value is less than the ASCII code for 0. So it could be a digit character. Uh, ASCII code 0 through 9, but it can also be above, above in value, that, that code. So we need another test to bracket it at the other end. Okay, and, and um, this is where things can get a little bit more hairy. Compare with the ASCII code for 9. I mean, I'm just going um, by instinct here, almost. Which again, is another Newton rhythm for I don't know what I'm doing really. Okay, so let's let's try the same kind of uh, thinking process here. What's going to happen if we have uh, if we have something that is uh, uh, three eight, which would be valid, three nine, which is on the money, which would be also valid, and three a, which is invalid. Okay, let's just imagine what will happen if we subtract the ASCII code for 9 from 3, 8. What we're going to get is the carry bit set and the Z bit is going to be 0. I didn't put that in the last time because the result is not 0. Okay, we'd have, we'd have had to borrow uh, to subtract 3, 9 from 3, 8. Yes, sir? So you just go through how the carry bit is set. I'm not sure. How the carry bit is set. Well, wh when you perform the, the, the subtraction, okay, uh, uh, if if, uh, if, the, if the number that you're subtracting uh, uh, from is less than the number you're subtracting, then it's going to have to borrow a 1. Okay? Like it's like in the, in the old arithmetic, say, uh, 9 from 7. You can't take so you have to borrow You have to borrow 10. Sorry about that. Uh, better turn it off. Okay, so once again, sorry to disturb you there. So if you're subtracting a, a number like say 39 from 38, uh, 39 from 38, you can't take safe to borrow one. Okay, so that sets the carry bit. So the carry bit is the carry slash borrow bit. There's no possibility of ambiguity because you'd either be adding or subtracting. It's a borrow. It's a borrow, yeah. Yeah, oh, thank you, yeah. So, so uh, you're subtracting 39 from 38, so that's going to cause a borrow, and the borrow sets the carry bit. Okay, so yeah, so that's a that's borrow in that case. Well, it's called the carry borrow bit, but it's actually written the C bit. So that, that may be a, a slight confusion, more than a slight confusion. Okay, so, so you need to sort of mentally, very carefully go through this. Okay, so the carry bit will be set because of the borrow. The Z bit will be clear because you're not subtracting like things. So that's the situation there. If you subtract the ASCII code for 9 from the ASCII code for 9, the carry bit will be clear, you don't, you're not borrowing anything, uh, and the Z bit will be set. Leave those ands out for a minute. The Z bit will be set. So you could, you could, you could, so that might be diagnostic. And then if you're subtracting the ASCII code from 9 from, say, 3A, you'll have uh, neither the carry bit set nor the Z bit set. Okay? So if you wanted to say, <coughs> Um, I want to branch here. I want to branch under this condition, okay? Any of these conditions here. I want to branch if the C bit is clear and the Z bit is clear. What instruction would you, what condition would you be looking for? I think it's there, isn't it? Let me just go back here. So you can see, <coughs> hi, isn't it? Looks like that. I mean, let me see. Oh, that right at all, you know? Branch of hi. No. Okay. Yeah. So now.
Okay, I don't know how to I don't know how to hide that without my phone, so I just have to leave it there. So we could say branch if I to no. Okay. Now again, I have to tell you that that I'm very sort of leery of these kind of things because looking at this thing, branch. So what I would actually do, and what I have done in these cases is I've actually moved the comparison on from the last legitimate item to one past it, okay? Because it makes more sense to me, yeah. So, or compare the byte whose value is the ASCII code for nine plus one, okay? So this is, this is my dirty rotten hack. Uh, and branch if the carry bit is clear to no. Okay, now it's going to take the same amount of time to execute. The expression is there, but that expression is calculated into binary at ascending time, not at one time. So it's the same amount of time, um, and it's just the way that I've gotten into the habit of doing this. I'm not suggesting it's dead right, but it just is a little bit clearer to me, so your mileage may vary. Okay, so instead of having 10 comparisons, as you, we would have naively two, two comparisons, we're doing a range check rather than a an individual itemized check. Okay. Any questions? BCC. Oh, I should have said branch of carry bit is clear. Okay. This, uh, this one here was branch of carry bit is set. BCC, BCS. Okay, so that's just an example. Uh, and, you know, I'm tempted actually now to go off on a slight tangent because um, it would be good to have a look at, at a fairly substantial example of um, programming using <coughs> that kind of a check and also touching on an idea that we're, we're going to have to come to sooner or later. And so what I want to do is, is this. I want, to, I want to explore that idea that I was just talking about. Suppose you have a situation where somebody is uh, typing something in and it comes in in a sequence of characters, or where you might be reading through a file of text and you, you come upon a, a, a sequence of characters like, say, say this, uh, 4, 9, 3, 1, okay? And you say, okay, that's the character 4, the character 9, the character 3, the character 1, right? And in hex, that looks like 3, 4, 3, 9, 3, 3, 3, 1, okay? And it's occupying a, it's occupying a long word. So here you have uh, the sequence of characters represented just as characters. Now suppose you want to represent that as, an, as a number, as a binary integer, 4,931. Can anybody tell me what that looks like in hex, please? What 4,931, if you have a calculator handy. Just tell me what 4931 looks like. Anybody got a calculator? Calculator? All you math people, it's in, the, it's in there somewhere. Okay. So the question I have is, how do you get from this kind of a representation of a sequence of, of, a, of a number, which is what we recognize, to the internal binary uh, 1343? Three, three. Three, three. Okay. So it looks like hex that when you look at it as characters and it looks like this <coughs> one three four three yeah. it looks like this when it's in straight binary integer form so the question is how do you get from this to this okay how do you in other words take in a sequence of uh, ASCII characters that you know represents a decimal number and convert that into its binary form so that you can do calculations easily on it in the machine. Okay? Anybody got any ideas? Okay, I'm going to stop here for a minute and just ask you to think about this for a moment. You already probably can work out if it was a single digit number. Okay? If it was a single digit number, could you do it? What would you do? Who said yeah? Yeah, you subtract uh, the hex value of 30 from it. 
Yeah. Here. Okay, so if you if you had any single digit number, like say seven, okay, you could get to uh, zero 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 seven simply by taking the the ASCII code of that, which is hex three seven, <coughs> subtract hex three zero from it, and that would give you this. Just do it all in a word or a long word side. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. So. Um, now, so suppose you had a two-digit character, a, a two-digit number. What would you do? Don't you answer now, because I think he might have the answer. Has anyone else got any? Where are the mathematicians? Hands up the mathematicians. One, don't be shy. Right? Remember, analysis, analytical, thinking. Okay, up here for thinking. Right? So, what would you do? Okay, thinking from a theoretical standpoint, okay? You go from single digit, which we can do, to double digit, we'll say, a double digit number. Yes, yes, sir. Subtract like the 300 and something in the first half, and then the, or in the, in the top half, and then the 30 from the bottom half. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Divide it by the. Yeah, sorry, yeah, it, it, yeah, you're, yeah, but we could actually make that a bit simpler. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Divide it by the, the base. So. Divide it by the base. Say you know, like, <coughs> thirty-five and that's like whatever ten, three and nine, three, 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 three. Yeah, you're on the right track, yeah. You're much closer to it, yeah. But I think you're going out of there uh, backwards. Take three thousand and thirty. Take three thousand and thirty. Yeah, no, I, I mean this line here is a bit closer, I think, to the to the way of it. I mean you made the right observation because you're going the wrong direction with it. I mean you're going actually completely the wrong direction. Like hundred and eighty degrees the wrong direction. But the observation is right. Hey, welcome to Trinity College. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Would anyone else like to take that maybe and just turn it around? Where is he? Hey! Very good, yeah. Okay, let me just uh, say here, because I think this is what you actually meant to say, right? Didn't you? Um, <laughs> you, have a, you start off with a single digit. Okay, if you, were, if you were the computer and you were walking down this sequence of characters, think of it like that. <coughs> well, you, well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't walk the other way, really. No, uh, no, no. Most probably you wouldn't. Just bear with me for a minute. You'd be walking from left to right, and the first character you'd see would be the character four. Okay. So you see the character four. You say, oh, okay. If that was a, if that was all there was to it, all I've got to do is subtract three zero from it, and I'm done. Okay. And then you look at the next character. And say, oh, go. It's another, it's another part of the number. So your original estimate of the value of the number is out by a factor of 10. So you multiply it by 10. You were walking up the, the other direction. Right? So you're right. You multiply it by 10. So your previous estimate of the value of the number was out by the base, as you, as you pointed out. Okay? Out by the base. So you multiply your previous guess by, by 10, the base, and you add in the value of the new one. Right? And then you just keep doing that. Okay? So there's your algorithm. You have a loop, character by character. You start off with your estimate, which we say is initially 0. Uh, you look at the character, if the character is still a digit character, your, your previous estimate is off by a factor of the base, 10 multiplied by 10, and add in the new value. And you just keep doing that until you run off the end of the character tree. Now there's only the stuff you actually go in the other direction, actually, so it just seems to me a little bit crazy. Okay, so will you try and write some code for that? Okay, a little bit of a loop, okay? You have to see if the next character that's coming in, <coughs> remember the vowel code where you, you had an A0 pointing at the characters? Okay, you might have a zero pointing to this. Uh, just a little bit of code. So you're looking at the character. You want to see if it's a digit character using the code we've just had a look at here. If it is a digit character, you have to perform a few operations. Uh, if it isn't a digit character, you're finished. Okay, so why are you trying to think about writing that code? And then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on. It. We'll, we'll write the code. So very good. <coughs>
limited to uh, limited to award. Okay, limit, limit, limit the, the maximum value of the incoming number that you're going to deal with to what would fit into a ward, 65,536. And, and keep it unsigned. So you're imagining then that you have a series of characters in memory, somehow they got there, maybe they've been typed in, or maybe they've just read in from a file, they're in memory. You want to see whether what you're pointing at within zero is uh, what the value of the sequence of characters, if they represent a decimal number, is. Okay. And I think it going from, from left to right, from the first digit down to the last. Zero's pointing to the uh, to the character. Let's do a little bit of initialization. Let's say we're going to accumulate the actual value in D0. So we'll, we'll initialize D0. <coughs> we'll initialize D0 with 0. We'll look at the character. We'll say compare the byte who's, uh, sorry, we won't. We get the character first. We'll move the character from where A0 is pointing into D1. And I'm going to sneak in a new addressing mode here, just for the hell of it, uh, because I hope we'll be talking about it tomorrow. Post increment plus, look at that, okay? It's a pointer, we're using A0 as a pointer, and so we have the brackets around it, but we now introduce this new addressing mode where <coughs> after A0 is used as a pointer, after it's used as a pointer, uh, it's going to be incremented automatically by the machine by one, by the width of a byte. Do you specify that to be a word and then by a word width? Yeah, it, it, the, the size of the, <coughs> the auto increment is dependent on the size of the operation. And we'll talk a lot more about it. It's called address register indirect with post increment. It's called post increment. Okay, so we now compare the byte that D1 is uh, contains with the ASCII code for zero. <coughs> And we're going to say branch if the carry bit is set to done. Uh, we're going to compare the byte whose value is 9 with D1. And we're going to say branch if high to done, as we figured out. Uh, now, if it drops through these two tests, it means we found a di another digit character, or at least another digit character. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our previous estimate, which is in D0, we're going to multiply that by 10, the base. So we'd say multiply unsigned D, uh, sorry, 10 into D0. Now we want to add in the value of the character that we have, that we have uh, read in, which is in D1. Now, uh, we're going to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping on D1. Prior, I'm going to add in an extra instruction at the start here. I'm going to say I want to move quick zero into D1 as well. So all of D1 is zero until we take in its ASCII, its ASCII character. So the uppermost 24 bits of D1 are zero. Um, 
the first 24 bits are, are so we just have to simply remove the, the three uh, the three uh, the hex three zero part of the uh, of the uh, character. So we can simply say subtract um, a byte whose value is the ASCII code of zero from D one, which is converting that single digit character. Uh, to its numerical equivalent. So if the character you read in was a character of seven, what we're going to end up with in D1, treating it as a complete long word, is the binary value for seven. And so we can simply add that D1 into D0. So we, we, have, we have made our correction. We said, oh, we're out by a factor of 10, made the correction there, and we've added in the value of the new digit. And now we can just branch always. So there's an unconditional branch to uh, loop, we call it. And loop will be here. Okay? And because we're using post increment here, this new addressing mode here, because we're using post increment, A0 is automatically pointing to the next character. Okay? So when uh, <coughs> it drops through to done, uh, either here or here, well, we know that we have encountered a non-digit character. That's the first thing we know. So let's say it might be, say, 4, 5, 6, space. We might have the space character in D1. But you need to note, uh, if you're writing this kind of code, that A0 is not pointing to that character just past the number sequence. It's pointing to the next one again, OK? Because it got a post increment again. There's a little a minor inconvenience. So it'll continue, it'll continue operation, OK? Didn't realize it was so late, so uh, we'll stop here and we continue tomorrow. Okay, so we're nearly out, we are out of the woods really as far as flow control is concerned. We have a tutorial on Thursday about it. Um, we're going to get on to subroutines tomorrow. I'm sure you can't wait.